Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I would like to welcome you to our inaugural Pride and Prejudice Summit. We're delighted to be hosting this event today across three continents, in Hong Kong, London, and New York. Today's 24-hour event brings together a really outstanding group of business executives and policymakers to explore the business and economic case for diversity and LGBT inclusion. The business case for LGBT inclusion is very simple. I'm looking to hire the very best people to work for my company, whether that's women, people of color, members of the LGBT community. And if I'm authentic as one of the very few openly gay CEOs in this country, I have greater success at hiring the absolute best talent. The business case at CIA for diversity and inclusion really speaks to the nature of our mission which is to understand the world in all of its complexity. And if we don't have people who have some experience with that diversity, with that range of backgrounds and cultures and ethnicities, we are depriving ourselves of having the ability to learn what's going on around the world. 75 countries in the world uh, still have laws that make it illegal. I think that it's really, really important that on issues like this, we have to make the moral case, the ethical case, but also the economic case. Uh, to deal with that kind of, uh, of difference, uh, we now know that it's going to be very important uh, for competitiveness going forward. I think in the near term, there will be challenges. The journey for a more fair and equitable world is not one overnight or in just one or two years. But over the long haul, the journey for a more fair world has to include businesses and business leaders have to speak out and speak up and ensure that within their own enterprises they include all employees regardless of their sexual orientation. In some ways success is probably that there are no more discussions about the business case for LGBT inclusion and that people just understand that this is yet another segment of our population that has different needs and different expectations just as all the rest do and that there's value in recognizing those differences. I have to admit, that's the first time that I've seen that video, but uh, good, to, good to be here. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very, very warm welcome to you all, and thank you for coming along today uh, to Pride and Prejudice, um, the uh, business, business, uh, a business as a catalyst for change. Um, I'd like to welcome also and thank uh, also all of those people that are listening in or watching uh, online. Uh, uh, this has been live streamed across social media, so a, a very warm welcome uh, to you as well. Uh, my name is Charles Goddard. I'm the editorial director for the Economist Intelligence Unit in Asia. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by two very able, uh, uh, able chairs, uh, Laurel West, who's the director, editorial director for Thought Leadership uh, in Asia, and John Fassman. Uh, John, down here. Uh, John is the Southeast Asia Bureau Chief for The Economist newspaper. Um, the Economist is passionate uh, about diversity. We um, have consistently argued um, in the newspaper, particularly, uh, that diverse, open uh, economies are uh, thriving. Uh, they're the most dynamic, um, most interesting, and most innovative uh, economies. And they help shape um, the, I suppose, most interesting um, socially and intellectually, I think, um, uh, rich societies as well. Uh, of course, the prevailing the prevailing mood of exclusion in the United States at the moment, and in Europe, and in some, uh, and in Britain, and some parts of Europe, uh, of course, is uh, flying in the face of uh, this uh, view that we hold. Of course, it's flying in the face of evidence as well around that, uh, and we're running against a tide of um, illiberal populism, uh, as you're all aware, I'm sure. And it's one of the issues that we're going to be raising today. Uh, and looking at and seeing how that might uh, affect the, uh, the whole LGBT issue. But what is true for countries is in many ways true for com companies too. And I, uh, as you heard in the video, is increasingly, and as we heard last year uh, many, many times, um, the evidence bears out. That is that business, businesses that embrace uh, diversity, businesses that are inclusive, are more likely to be successful. They're more likely to be uh, profitable. They're more likely to be places where 
uh, diverse groups where women, where um, uh, those that are un underrepresented minorities, where the LGBT community, the lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, and uh, transgender community feel comfortable working, where they want to come to work, where they want to bring, uh, as the expression goes, their true selves uh, and talents uh, to their work. Um, I know for many in the room that that will, obviously, that will appear quite obvious, but um, uh, quite apart from it being right, of course, it makes good business sense, as, as you heard on the video, and as uh, we've all been discussing. Yet, of course, I think um, in many companies uh, in Asia particularly, um, uh, and you may recall right at the beginning, for those of you here last time, you may recall right at the beginning of last of the very first of the Pride and Prejudice series, uh, Daniel Franklin, the executive editor of The Economist and the chair of that series, uh, talked about the deafening silence uh, from Asian companies around uh, the LGBT issue. Um, you may recall that uh, most LGBT people in this region feel highly uncomfortable, profoundly uncomfortable, um, uh, bringing uh, and reluctant to reveal their sexual identities um, uh, and uh, sexual preferences uh, for fear that this might result in discrimination or indeed further discrimination because discrimination, of course, occurs without even uh, the disclosure uh, happening. I think for many businesses, and I've, I've uh, been around the region um, in Vietnam, in Manila, in Indonesia, doing uh, work with the UNDP uh, in small groups, listening to um, LGBT uh, groups within companies talking about the issues they face. Um, for many companies in the region, um, denial is the default. Um, uh, there's a view that there aren't really problems uh, around discrimination in their companies. Um, uh, and that therefore there is really no need to uh, set out clear policies in those companies that tackle uh, discrimination uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, I think equally, um, the wide gap between those companies, those domestic companies and multinational companies uh, in the region, I think should, not still, uh, should still not hide the very considerable task that remains in many multinational companies in the region uh, as well uh, around LGBT. Michael Gold, and I'm not sure Michael is, uh, an editor at uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit, will be talking about a survey of senior executives uh, for global, uh, of global companies uh, that the Economist Intelligence Unit has done, um, the results of which finds that while most of those uh, surveyed um, uh, positively support uh, LGBT inclusion, um, that uh, they also, most of them also still perceive um, surprisingly high levels uh, of uh, intolerance and discrimination in their companies as well. So last year, our first PMP event, as uh, Tom Standish was staying uh, on, uh, on the film, explored the status of LGBT rights around the world, uh, and it looked at the economic and the business case for inclusion. Um, this year, the focus of today's discussion is uh, going to be around, uh, is going to be more forward-looking. We're going to be looking at can, and indeed how can, um, uh, businesses be agents uh, of or catalysts for uh, change in uh, LGBT, positive change in LGBT inclusion. Uh, and who within those businesses specifically um, are best poised to drive that change? Um, uh, we look particularly uh, at millennials. The first session we've got is uh, with a group of uh, millennials. Uh, and at the lessons uh, of, uh, also at the lessons of uh, the broader struggles for gender equality. Um, that are happening, uh, and other axes of diversity, women, and so on and so forth, that could uh, be uh, helpful in informing and shaping the way in which uh, the drive for greater LGBT inclusion uh, uh, takes place. And of course, as I said earlier, we're looking topically at this question of the illiberal uh, global environment that we're beginning to face. Um, and uh, in Asia, particularly at uh, some of the challenging political um, circumstances of, uh, and social circumstances of moving liberalization around LGBT forward. No doubt the T word uh, will come up uh, sooner rather than later, um, uh, even before I'm sure that we move to London and to New York, uh, where this will be, uh, I think, more of a focal point of the discussion. And of course, this day is not just the eight or nine hours that we're going to spend in the room together here. It's going to be 
um, a, a global event. It's a marathon that takes uh, place pretty much as the stock markets shift from one region to the other. Uh, as the day closes here, we'll move to London uh, with Zanny Minton Beddoes, the editor-in-chief of The Economist, who will be uh, uh, leading and chairing that session there. And as soon as London closes, we'll be going to New York um, and uh, with Tom Standage chairing there. Um, so a full day of live streaming will be happening as well um, on uh, prideandprejudice.economist.com. So please go to that website, a couple of housekeeping points here. Uh, there's also research on that website. The research that Michael will be talking about is there and various other bits and pieces as well. Um, before we begin the day, I do really want to thank our sponsors. I just uh, had a word with Tony uh, from IBM here, without whom, really, this really cannot happen. This is a very special event. It is probably our most special single-day event, uh, and really, without the sponsors, we cannot uh, do this. It's simple. Um, let me just uh, talk about them. We have a highly appropriate tiering, uh, tiering labels here. Global Advocate, IBM. Um, thank you. Global supporters, uh, Alex Partner, AXA, and Morgan Stanley. Uh, regional advocate, uh, Goldman Sachs. Um, regional ally, ABN AMRO uh, Bank. Uh, regional supporters, uh, Nomura and uh, Ogilvy & Mather. Um, and the PR agency, Havas PR, and of course our host sponsor uh, today, the United Nations uh, Development Program. Uh, a very warm thank you to all of you for supporting this uh, event. Uh, you have an app, um, uh, which I hope you've been able to download, um, uh, the details of which are uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, that has the conference bios, the speakers, et cetera, et cetera. It has uh, ways of meeting each other, uh, if you uh, would like to do that. Um, and of course, it's where the poll, uh, the polls take place. Uh, and we'll just be introducing a poll uh, very shortly. Uh, and of course, it's where the evaluation survey is. Please do use that at the end of the session or throughout the day to help us understand how this is hopefully adding, adding value to the uh, LGBT discussion. Uh, if you have any problems connecting to the app, do uh, just uh, contact one of our staff members. They'll be uh, heading around. The, they'll be in the room, uh, uh, and they'll help you download the, the app if you're having problems. Uh, and of course, please, we encourage uh, old-fashioned interaction too. Uh, stick up your hand. Um, um, uh, somebody will come around with a microphone. We really do hope this is an interactive day. This is not about us on stage. It's hopefully about everybody off stage as well, giving your thoughts, your views, your perspectives, and, of course, any questions that you may have uh, for the panelists. Um, please do uh, make sure you do that. We have uh, also a high-tech uh, polling system on the tables itself, uh, the yes-no cards that you see there. Um, that will uh, we'll, we'll occasionally throw out a question to you if you could just answer on those cards that... Uh, uh, that's what they're there for. And um, we invite you to share your thoughts also on social media. So uh, hashtag economist, uh, econ pride uh, and follow us, of course, on uh, at economist events. So let's begin, shall we? And uh, let's begin with uh, a survey. Um, uh, in fact, we have been um, polling uh, leading up to today's events. We've been, cre we've been doing some online polls. Um, uh, to gauge how the social media universe uh, looks at some of the questions that we'll be looking at today. Um, and we're going to ask you the same questions in the audience now. Um, and we've got uh, that one of these questions. Get your polling, uh, your polling um, uh, the app and the polling uh, bit on the app ready. Uh, the first question, are young employees changing uh, the way companies have to think about LGBT issues? Okay, whilst you're answering that poll, and I'm waiting for the results to come, uh, so it's a yes-no, by the way, um, whilst you're answering that, I'm going to invite uh, the first three panelists up to the stage, please, if you could come up to the stage. Uh, 